Well, good morning once again, or good afternoon, or good evening, or whatever time it is. So good to see everyone this morning. And I just want to, once again, I want to invite everyone uh, to, to participate in small groups. Again, I'm just going to go ahead and announce myself again, because sometimes we cut out the first part of the service for later on when people come watch it. But my name is Eric Bucci once again, and I am the lead pastor here at the Cornerstone Church. We're so glad that you're here today. And if you'd like, um, I want to just encourage everybody uh, just to welcome. Can we, do me, can we do a big favor? If it's your first time here today or have not been here in a long time, we want to welcome you back. We also want to welcome everyone that's watching online. Can we give a big hello? Come on. Nice, big, loud. Let everyone know you love them. Uh, you know, uh, uh, much to do about nothing. They, they worried about the snowstorm. There's not much to speak of. So I appreciate I, if you're home, we understand that. And if you're home because of COVID, we understand that as well. But man, we'd love to have you come back. It's a wonderful opportunity to be here in the room and worship together and fellowship with other people. In fact, I just want to encourage everyone what's happening. We're starting to kick off our small groups this Sunday. As you leave here today, take one of these. Um, and also, they have a special snack for you out there. It's calorie-free until you, until you walk off the campus. Once you leave the church, then the calories come back on. So uh, that's what's happening, and there's a bunch of small groups. We want to encourage you. You know what? It's great coming here on a Sunday morning, and it's like having a family meal together. But when you're in a small group, you get to know people on a first-name basis. You get to grow, and, and I'll tell you, some of the greatest things in my life have been a result of small groups and, and fellowship with other believers. We really want to encourage you to look through. There's something here for you, and if there's nothing here for you, we'll make one up for you. I'm serious. If you really want to be a part of a small group, just let us know, and we're going to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to connect through a small group. Well, we're beginning a new series today called Unshakable, and it's all about being unshakable. You guys are so smart. And the reason we're talking about it for is simply this, is I just believe that we're living, how many of you believe this? We're living in a difficult climate right now in our world. And God wants us to be unshakable in what we're doing, that our life is not based upon what happens here. Our life is based upon the kingdom of heaven. And so what we're going to do today, we're going to look at the book of 1 Peter. We're actually starting a new series today. Sometimes we'll do a topical series, but this is more of line by line, verse by verse. We're going to go through First Peter. So I encourage you to go home and read it throughout the week, underline it, study it. We're going to go through it together. It's a very powerful book of the Bible. We're going to talk about the author in a few moments. But First Peter is a very powerful book of the Bible. In fact, in other parts of the world, it's one of the most famous and one of the most sought after books in the Bible. And the reason is, not much in the Western world, in America, for example, is because we don't have a lot of persecution. But in other places like North Korea, places like Iran, places like China, and other countries in the world, Cuba, that First Peter is a very popular book. In Romania, when it was under communist occupation, it was a very, very, very popular book of the Bible because it deals with persecution. How do you handle persecution? How do you overcome persecution? Now, I don't think we really understand what persecution looks like as this, at this point in our culture. Maybe someone unfriends you on Facebook, oh well, or Twitter. But I don't think we understand, but I, I do believe this, everybody. I do believe this, and I'm not saying this to scare you, but I believe that God is calling the church, at least Cornerstone, to prepare ourselves for the coming days. And I do believe, based upon what we see in society, based upon the trends of society and, and the word of God, the, the way of the world is getting further and further and further from the word of God. And people are now beginning to attack what the word of God says. And Jesus said, if they attack me, they're going to attack you. So I do believe, I'm not quite sure when, but I believe it's happening right now to a certain degree. It's going to rise up more and more persecution because the ways of the world are different than the ways of God. And so what we need to be able to do is to learn how to handle persecution. And I will say this, and, and listen, I know this is kind of heavy, but it's important we understand this. I would say often in the American church, in the Western church, we have sold Christianity, I believe, and sometimes incomplete. We tell people that if you want to be happy, give your life to Jesus. And that's absolutely true. If you want to have a better marriage, give your life to Jesus. Well, that's true as well. If you want to have a better job, give your life to Jesus. If you want a new car, give your life to Jesus. 
Whatever you need, give your life to Jesus, and he'll going to help you achieve the happiness and the success you are deemed. For after all, you're a king's kid, and you should be successful. And they tell you that. Now, those are all true, but it doesn't necessarily mean now. It doesn't mean that your life will be problem-free. It doesn't mean you won't be persecuted. And so what happens is we've told people that you can become all that you've become to be, and now celebrities are doing it as well. They say, oh, I serve Jesus. Meanwhile, their lives have no fruit. And we're like, I'm a Christian, but there's going to come a day when the persecution comes where there's going to be a separation. And this has happened in other parts of the world. We don't have all these denominations. You're either a Christian or you're not because they don't have time to play. And see, I believe that their days are coming. And so I think it's important that we learn what First Peter has to say and that we build our lives upon the rock because there are going to be days coming. I don't know when, but there are days coming where persecution is going to start hitting the Western church, hitting the USA. And we better have ourselves prepared. One of our dear friends, Brian Cosmos, came to, to share with the roof this past, uh, the youth, not the roof, the youth, that were, uh, not on the roof, the youth, and he shared how he went through a very difficult physical issue that he had to go through. It was pretty traumatic. And he, he challenged the young people and said this. He says, you need to prepare ahead of time so when difficult times come, you're ready. And I'm, I'm telling you right now, I believe it's very strong, not just me. We need to prepare ourselves. We need to put away the elementary things. And we need to focus on what really matters in life. There's nothing wrong with enjoying things. I'm not, don't get me wrong. But we need to make sure we're right with Christ. So 1 Peter does that. 1 Peter breaks it down. 1 Peter tells us how to overcome in a difficult set of circumstances. And Peter was an apostle of Jesus. And so what we're going to do today is this. We're going to start with the first couple of, of, couple of words of the verse. And we're going to talk about Peter, who Peter is, what he went through. I think it's important we understand who Peter was. Because he's the author of this book through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. First Peter, when he wrote this, it was about some scholars, they, they're not quite sure, but we believe it's someplace in the 60s, not the 1960s, but AD 60. And, and, and the apostle uh, Peter was, it was getting older in age. In fact, they also believe that Nero, who was a crazy Roman emperor, began to persecute Christians. Some scholars think this is before that happened. Some people think it's during, some people think it's after or just the beginning. And Nero was a horrific emperor of Rome, and he basically blamed the Christians for the fire in Rome. He found a scapegoat. He began to torture Christians. He threw them in arenas with lions. He would, stick, he would dip them in oil and light them on fire. I mean, it was bad. This Nero was bad. And so I, I don't know quite sure when this was written, but it was written around the time of Nero or during Nero. We're not quite sure. But we do know this. There is persecution in the church. And, and the Apostle Peter writes this letter to the church. And it is not a specific geographical church like 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. No, it is a region. So let's go ahead. We're going to open the Word of God today because I believe we need to understand the lessons learned here. And that we prepare ourselves. And when situations happen, we're ready. We're not falling apart. I, I do believe, everybody, that COVID, the economic downturn, the civil unrest we see in our culture from all sides of the political spectrum, are signs of things to come. And we really need to wake up. Let's not sleep. Let's not hit the snooze button. Let's get ourselves right with God at this time. It's important. And I understand sometimes the greatest threat to the church starts with a C, comfort. Really, it often is the greatest threat to the church is when we get so comfortable, we forget what's really going on. So. Let's begin 1 Peter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Let's stop there for a moment. He says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. He didn't say, I'm one of the apostles. He says, I'm an apostle. Everyone knows who Peter is. He is a, one of the founding 12 of the apostles. He says, Peter, an apostle, apostolus, is one that is sent out. One that's sent out. And so these apostles would go out and they'd be sent out and they would start churches, they'd start movements, and God utilized early apostles to do that. So Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, not of himself, but of Jesus Christ. He doesn't go around saying, my ministry, I'm in, I'm in, first, I'm in the Peter's ministry. Peter's ministries. No, I am of Jesus Christ. It wasn't about him. It wasn't about his pedigree. It wasn't about his personality. He says this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those 
who are elect exiles. Elect means chosen. You are elect exiles. And, and it's written to the Jews and the Gentiles, elect, you are chosen exiles, people not in their own land. In other words, they are they're, they're refugees. They are pilgrims. This, we, we are aliens. Okay? We are elect exiles. We're in exile. This is not our home. And if you don't feel like it's your home, good, because it's not your home. This is temporary. So the elect, in other words, you are chosen by God. You know what? God chose you, and you responded to it. Now, are you Calvinism? or aren't you? We're not going to get into that today. You'll be surprised when we look at the Word of God, what it has to say. It's not about a different theory. What it's about is this. You are chosen by God. You are chosen by God. So you are elect exiles of the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Berthias. In other words, there was persecution in Jerusalem. They were spread out, and they were spread out in different areas. They're exiles. They're going through difficult times. Maybe you feel exiled. Maybe you're exiled from your family. Maybe you feel like you don't really belong in this world anymore. Well, guess that's what happens. Jesus says, be in the world, but not of the world. And so he's really writing to this church that is spread out, that is experiencing great deal of persecution. Some have lost families, lost jobs, lost their lives. And so he's writing to the church that are in exile. So what I want to do right now is I want to look at Peter, his life. Peter grew up in the area of the Sea of Galilee, which is like a large lake. We had a wonderful trip. Uh, we went to Israel as a church. We'd hope to go again once COVID gets behind us and do another trip, a really educational and a wonderful spiritual experience. And we've been there. And that area, he had a fishing business with his brother and his father. Apparently, they had some income. They did fairly well. Okay, that's what you can tell based upon what they did. In fact, they, found this, they actually did some archaeological digs and they found the fishing boats that, that were the time of Christ. And so they had a fishing business. That's what they did. They were kind of from the deep south. <laughs> you know, I don't want to pick on anybody because we're northerners here, but we do have people that are church from the south and they have a little bit of a southern accent. And I'm not going to mention John Williams, who's in the back with his wife, who leads worship here. He's from Alabama, has a little bit of an accent. That's God's English. But they had kind of, let me, let me go ahead and say, let's say that, that Peter was from Brooklyn. Okay? You know, have an accent. You could tell he was not from the upper area of the country. Hey, hey Peter. You know, that's how he kind of talked, okay? So he had an accent. People know he was a Galatian. He was uncouth. He was blue collar. I'm going to call it what it is. He was a blue collar worker, right? Not, not educated, but made good money, all right? So Peter is called to leave everything and follow Jesus. And he responds to it. In fact, you can see in Matthew 4, 18, and Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. And Andrew said, hey, come meet this guy, Jesus. Andrew was a disciple, disciple of John the Baptist, who was Jesus' cousin. So basically, he left being him, and he began to follow Jesus. And he took Peter with him. So what happens is Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee, sees these guys, right? And Andrew, his brother, casting their net into the sea, for they were fishermen. They're doing their job. Now I'm going to go ahead and go to another scripture in Luke. And what happened is this is that Jesus actually utilized Peter's boat to speak to a crowd one day. He got in a boat, went out, like an amphitheater, if you will. When you have water, it actually helps amplify. And so he began to speak. Then he came back in, and he tells Peter to do something. Here it is. He says, throw your net to the other side. So Jesus, we fished all night. Here we go. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Because the fishermen, they're supposed to fish at night. Nevertheless... At your word, I will let down the net. How about that? God, I've tried all my life to, to stop this, but because of your word, I'm going to do what you said to do. That's the kind of position we should be in. And something incredible happens. He drops his net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. There were so many fish that their boats began to sink. It was the catch of the century. And they were overwhelmed by that. Think about it. Everything you've worked so hard for in your entire life, you've never seen it like this before. I mean, incredible. So they, they came out of that and they looked at that. And when Simon Peter saw it, what did he do? He fell down at his knees saying, depart from me, 
for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. When he was in the presence of Jesus, he knew that he was a sinful man. He says, I'm not worthy of this. It was a miracle, right? For he and all who were with them were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. So he was overwhelmed by it. Then Jesus says something else to him. Then he said to them, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Jesus does not say live for me. He says follow me. When follow me means follow me, it means relationship, not rules. There are rules in the relationship, but the relationship is first. He says, come, follow me. And that's our job, everybody, to follow Christ. The Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He's making a transition here. You see all the great success I have here? I'm going to make you a fisher of men. In other words, I'm calling you to be my understudy. I'm calling you to be with the great rabbi. And more than likely, a lot of Hebrew boys would grow up in that culture, and the upper echelon would be chosen by the rabbis to be taught by them. They were the cream of the crop. So apparently these guys didn't get the catch. They didn't get in the high religious order. And here now is a great rabbi, a great teacher. He says, come follow me, which was an incredible honor because a lot of the people looked up to those people, and now they've been chosen. So what happens? They immediately left their nets and followed him. They left it all behind. I think they put it in storage. You'll see later on the reason why. They put it in a storage bin, maybe a pod. All right, Peter's journey with Jesus. The second one is this. Jesus changes Peter's name. When you give your life to Jesus, you are a new creation. Old things, are, old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. And he brought him to Jesus. Now, when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. Simon means dove. You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which actually this Greek word Petra, which is translation, a stone. So you're going from being a, 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 a bird, if you will, a dove, to a stone. You are a rock, Peter. And did Peter do anything yet? No. He just accepted Christ. You see, your identity is wrapped up in who Jesus says who you are, not what you think in your own mind. Today, there's a lot of identity issues going on. We all struggle with our identity. And our identity is found in Jesus Christ. If you're not sure of who you are, find who you are in Christ, and you'll find your identity. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated as stone. So, so he gives him a new name. Peter is also the first disciple named in the list of the 12. When they named the 12 apostles, he's the first one. Peter is often the first. He's the first guy for almost all the things. He's the guy that steps out. We often make fun of him. Oh, Peter. I, listen, Peter's a great guy. A lot of people stand and watch. He took the risk. He was willing to go out on a limb. I would say that Peter, in many ways, is very much like an American. Someone that lives in the United States of America. Peter was like that. He was loud. <laughs> he was boisterous. He had an opinion on everything. Now, I... I don't cancel me out, okay? I'm a U.S. citizen. I'm born here. We can, can I talk about my own people? All right? Yeah. Around the world, Americans are known to be arrogant, loud, and obnoxious. I'm just telling you the truth. They love us because we spend a lot of money in their countries. But we're known to share our opinion. Okay? Did I offend you? Get over yourself. Build a bridge. Okay? Peter's the first. He's basically like an American. That's why I can really identify with him. Sometimes I say things I shouldn't say. He had something called the hand and foot, foot and the mouth disease. He would say things he wished he didn't say. And I can tell you right now, that's my family. I say a lot of things I wish I never... Okay, let's move forward. So Peter's the first disciple named in the list of the 12. Peter's the first guy to walk on water, except for Jesus. Jesus is walking on water. They're in a perfectly good boat. There's a storm going on. And Peter goes, Jesus, if that's you, command me to come out on the water. Jesus says, come. And you know what Peter walks on? Does he walk on water? He walks on the word. He walks on the word. Come. And he walks on the water. As he kept his eyes on Jesus, he walked on the water. All the other disciples were in the boat. He's the guy that stepped out. Then he goes, wait, what am I doing? Sometimes he puts himself in the gear before his mind catches up. Okay, like, like the roadrunner. Remember the roadrunner? He runs over the cliff. He's like this. He thinks he's still, and he goes, looks down. He goes, whoops. That's what happened to Peter. So Peter fell. Help me, Lord. And he picked him up. So he walks in the water. Peter's also is the first confession. When, when people began to not like Jesus' teaching, his teaching got hard. And many in the crowd left him. He had a huge mega church. He went down from mega church with a big campus down to a handful of people in one sermon. 
He would have been fired by most boards. Because he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. So what happens? Peter says, no. Where are we going to go? We're going to follow you. So Peter confessed, after many disciples have turned away, he says, I'm sticking with you. So great guy, right? Then Peter has a confession of Jesus being the Messiah. And so they go to a place called Caesarea Philippi, which is a place of rest that we're going. And Jesus is saying, who do people say the Son of Man is? And, and Jesus says, well, people say this, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said this, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. He's the first human being, disciple, to say you are Christ, you are the Messiah. And Jesus is astonished by what he had to say and says the following. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. In other words, that my Father has opened your eyes that you see the truth. You're hearing from God. And he goes on. He's not done yet. Blessed are you. Why is he blessed? And I also I say to you that you are Peter. And he changes his name to Rock. You are Petrus. You are Rock, right? And on this rock, I will build my church. On your confession, you are the first one, and others will be built upon that rock. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. And we're still here today, after many, after the Roman Empire, after all the different empires that came up, we are still here. The gates of hells shall not prevail upon it. Amazing, right? Amazing. Peter's like, wow, I hit the jackpot. Then a couple of verses later, Jesus calls him a son of God, and then he calls him the son of the devil. A few, a few verses later, Jesus rebukes Peter. Because in the same chapter, a couple of verses later, Jesus says, I'm going to have to suffer. I'm going to have to die. I'm going to have to go through all kinds of difficulty. And Peter is a good guy. I mean, if you tell someone you're going to have to suffer, wouldn't you like a friend to come to you and say, hey, listen, no, I don't want you to suffer. Eric, please, I don't want you to have to go through that. That, that shows they care about you, right? You would think, right? No, that's not what happens. Look what happens when Peter tries to bring comfort to Jesus. Look what Jesus says to him. He turned around and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. So one moment you're walking with God, hearing from God, having an experience with God, and the other moment you're part of the satanic regime. What on earth? Well, has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. Have you ever had a great devotional? And I mean, it's amazing, a great time in God, great things are happening, and all of a sudden, you, you, you have grown a, a retreat or some amazing a spiritual event, you have an epiphany, it's phenomenal. I remember there's a guy at our uh, old church, not here, we went to Promise Keepers event, him, his, his wife and him were on a voyage of, of, of divorce, he called his wife up, he was crying with, he said, honey, I forgive, I forgive you too, honey. He went home all excited about it, he gave his life to Jesus, and he gives us a call, later on says, my wife's gonna leave me. I mean, he went from a high to a low. He said, I blew it, I completely lost it, I've acted like that, never have acted before. How many of you have ever experienced that? Not that situation, but others. You, you have a great time with God, and the next moment, you're like, how did I just do what I just did? And you feel like such a squirrel. I don't know, I just say squirrel because I like it, okay? <laughs> but he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. His heart was on the things of men. This is something that plagued Peter, and it plagues all of us as well. When we begin to evaluate our life and evaluate how we handle situations, not based on the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of men. Then we see a transfiguration. He sees, he sees uh, Jesus transfigured before him, Moses and Elijah. And what does he do? Peter again. He jumps right to it. Let's do something. I'm not going to sit there. Let me just go ahead and engage my mouth, engage my action without thinking. Okay, there he goes again. What does he do? Let's build a tabernacle. One to, one to Moses, one to Elijah, one to you, Jesus. And all of a sudden, God gets in the action and says the following. He says, this is my beloved son who I'm well pleased. Listen to him and then it disappears. Now, I think that's a what for. And all of a sudden, all the glory stopped, and he was like, okay. So he was, he was kind of waking to that. Then we have a situation where we have Peter in the foot washing. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus was washing his disciples' feet, and it was something a slave would do, not, not, not an honorary guest of a house, especially a rabbi. And he goes, no, 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 Jesus, you shall never wash my feet. He says, if I don't wash your feet, I'll have nothing to do with you. 
No, 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 wash all of me. Then we have this. They're at the table. They're having communion. The first time they had communion. And he's talking to the disciples saying that, that I'm going to be denied. When are you going to deny me? I'm going to be killed. And Peter's like, uh-uh, no way, uh-uh. All these other cats, they may deny you, but Jesus, you can count on me. You can count on me. I'll stand by you. He started singing the song, right? Peter claims he'll never deny Jesus. If everyone else does, I will not. Jesus says, you will betray me three times. It's like, no, I'll never do that. Then Jesus calls him to pray because he's really having a hard time. He's going he's gonna to be arrested and go to the cross. Hey, watch and pray. He goes to him three times. He keeps falling asleep. It's like some of you right now in church. <laughs> then what else happens? Then Peter uses a sword and cuts the ear off a guard. Like he's so, why is he doing that? And I never hear anyone talk about this, so I'm going to talk about it. Do you realize prior to this happening, Jesus told his disciples to buy swords. He basically said, go to Cabela's and get some guns. I mean, that's kind of what he said. I mean, then he said to them, but now he who has money, a bag, let him take it, and likewise, a knapsack, and he who has no sword, let him sell his garments and buy one. He says this a little before this happened. So get a sword. And of course, Peter's like, you better believe it. I'll get a sword. So he goes, he goes to Cabela's, picks up a big, you know, picks up a big handgun, and he's got it loaded, he's got it on him now. He's got his sword, he's ready to go, right? Jesus said, buy a sword, all right? So that's exactly what he does. Okay, do you see the context? So you're thinking, obviously something's gonna happen. This is exciting. We're gonna be able to kick some Roman uh, tail or we're gonna, do, we're gonna make our kingdom. We're gonna be, a, we're gonna take over. He's the Messiah. This is what we've been praying for. Something's gonna happen. Well, what happens at the garden? Judas comes, kisses Jesus, betrays him. Then Simon Peter having a sword. Why did he have a sword? Why? Because Jesus told him to buy one. So what is he trying to do? He's trying to do what Jesus asked him to do. So he's, he's ready to die for Jesus right there. What he said at that night was true. He was ready to go down with Jesus. He pulled the sword out. He started fighting. He cut the guy's ear off, Malchus's ear off. And then Jesus says, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So wait a minute here. Jesus told me to get a sword. Now the time comes, and he tells me to put, I don't know what to do. I, I've tried to follow you, Jesus. You told me to start this business. You told me to have this marriage. You told me to, 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 to ask for forgiveness. I've done what you've asked me to do, and now it's all falling apart. Jesus, what's going on? I, don't, I can't figure this thing out. He's destitute. Is there any wonder he fleed? The next thing you know, a teenage girl by a charcoal fire freaks him out. I never understood that until I had a teenage daughter. <laughs> I love my daughter. But Peter denies Jesus three times and even starts dropping F-bombs of the day. Okay, he was like, he's swearing like a drunken sailor. I'm sorry for the sailors. But he was, he was swearing. He was, look what happens here in, in Matthew 26. Are you, you are with them three times. Starts off with a teenage girl. He can't handle that. Okay, then he begged, he began to evoke a curse on himself and swear, I do not know that man. Why? He was disappointed. He was confused. He didn't know what was going on. Is it any wonder? I don't know. I don't think I'd fare any better. Do you? And immediately the rooster crowed. He remembered. It also says in another gospel, his eyes locked with Jesus. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus. Before the rooster crows, you would deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. He was disgusted with himself. Have you ever been disgusted with yourself? He was. Absolutely. And then, do you realize that Peter is told that Jesus has risen from the dead? Check this out. This is really cool. How God is about the restoration business. But go, the angel says, but go tell his disciples and Peter. Notice that. God makes sure that not only the disciples know that Jesus is risen from the dead and let Peter know too because he's going to need to know this because he's feeling shameful right now. Listen, when you make a mistake and you fail, Jesus is looking for you. He's looking for me. 
He's not trying to beat you up. He wants to save you. He wants to help you when you're below it. So he's going before you go. There you will see him. Peter's also restored after the miracle of the fish. Then later on, they're at the Sea of Galilee again. And what does Peter do? I'm going to go fishing. Uh, I got my stuff out of storage. I opened the pot up, got the stuff out. We're going to go fishing again. What are you doing? Let's go fishing. So he's not just going fishing to go fishing. He's saying, more than likely, he's going back to his old ways. I, I think I've, I've lost it. I blew it. Christ Jesus, he trusted me. I blew it. I'm going back to fish. So he's out there fishing. There's a gentleman on the shore where there's a fire going. Have you caught any fish yet? No. Throw your net to the other side. What the heck? <laughs> you know? So they throw their heck to the next side. What happens? 153 fish come into the net. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of, oh, I'm sorry, throws his fish. He brings it in, right? Peter takes out, this is so funny. Peter puts his clothes on and jumps in the water. Why would you do that? Anyhow, that's beside. I, I just find that kind of interesting that he puts his clothes on and jumps in the water. I, I never saw that before until this week. I thought it was interesting. Okay? You learned something new today. Okay? So Peter's, and what happens? Jesus sits around a charcoal fire. What's the first time he denied Christ? Around a charcoal fire with a teenage girl. Now here's Jesus asking Peter. He says this. He says, Jesus said to Peter three times, Peter, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? He asked twice, do you agape me? And he kept saying, I phileo you. In other words, I love you like a brother. That's the love for a brotherhood. So finally Jesus says, okay, do you love me like a brother? Now there's significance in that. We could do it another time. And Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now what was he talking about? Was he talking about the other disciples or was he talking about the fish? Are you going to lay your, are you going to leave your, whatever it was. He said, you love me more than these or these. And, and he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs, which is an amazing thing. What Jesus does is he goes back and he heals his memories. He goes back to the place of failure and he goes to the charcoal fire. He goes three times and he pulls the thorn out each time. Jesus God wants to pull the thorns out of what you're facing. I really want to encourage you. We have a great small group called Freedom. I think every believer should go through it. Where we deal with some of these, these things in our past, where we can learn how to let Jesus pull out the thorns of our shame. And all of us have stuff. And if you don't have stuff, you really have stuff. So I encourage you to look at that. So that's what happened. He got freed of that. But you know what he said to him? He said, Peter, feed my sheep. You don't have to be a fisherman. I'm putting you back in charge. Peter, feed my sheep three times. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Peter, you're going to be the guy. Peter, I deputize you. Peter, I believe in you. And, and Jesus would say to you, I believe in you. I believe in you. I believe in you. I believe in you. No matter what you've been through, I believe in you. Receive my word. Receive my word, he says. And so what happens is he hears it. He's restored. And then something else happened. He said to he said the third time, Simon, son of, God, uh, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So then we have, again, Peter does a great job, and then he messes up. He reminds me of a squirrel. Let me explain. You ever been driving a car? And it happens to me all the time. And the, squir the squirrel's like running across the road. I try, I jam the brake on him. I practically crash the car. The squirrel, I miss the squirrel, like, oh, good. And I put my accelerator back on. And then the squirrel turns around and goes back. <laughs> Is that just me? Is that anybody else? Right? It's like, what the heck? That's what the apostle Peter would do. He'd do something right, and he'd turn around and get run over. So, <laughs> so here is, here's God saying something good to him. And then he goes like this. He says, Peter, when you were young, you went where you wanted to go. But when you're old, you're going to be taken where you do not want to go. Signify, signifying the kind of death he would have. And what did Peter do? He saw John. What about him? What about John? He's comparing himself to another believer. Now, we never do that here, do we? I never compare myself to another pastor. I never do that. I never compare to someone else and how they parent their kids. I never do that. I never compare my muscular body to somebody else's. 
Well, he's comparing himself right after a great healing. And what does Jesus say? If it's my will that he remains until I come, what is that to you? It's called witty. Be witty. What is that to you? You follow me. So we have Peter thinking on the things of man, right? That's why he rebuked and get behind me, Satan. And then he's once again thinking about how he's going to look at the other people. Then later on, something else happens. Peter is there on the day of Pentecost, okay? After Jesus ascends into heaven, on the day of Pentecost, guess who's the first one that speaks? Peter. He gives a sermon. 2,000 converts get baptized that first day. Then, 5,000. After a lame beggar got healed. I mean, and then there's a Gentile conversion. Cornelius, he's the first. God uses Peter as the first. Why? He's willing to step out. He's willing to take, make a mistake. Are you willing to step out of your, of your comfort zone? That's what happens. And then Peter's, Peter's shadow is healing people. People have enough faith to believe that God is with them that they're getting healed. Then, <laughs> here's the squirrel again. He gets rebuked by Paul. Because after God uses him to bring the Gentiles in, Later on, he's hanging out with the Judaizers, the, the, Gent, the Jewish church, and he's, he's showing racism. He's being a racist, basically, against the Gentiles. I'm not a racist. I was at Cornelius' house. <laughs> really? What are you doing right now? You're ashamed to be with the, you're trying to make the Jewish people happy? Why? Because you want to be seen good in the eyes of who? Men. So even with, listen, everybody, we have these ideas that these men and women of God, they walk around on clouds. They're not some Roman gods. They're not some Greek mythology gods. These are human beings like you and I that God works wonderfully with, and they make mistakes like you and I make, but God still works through them anyhow. I don't know about you, but that encourages me. So when the enemy sits there and says, you blew it, I said, yeah, I know. I mean, no, don't make a license for yourself, but God will utilize. I need to wrap this up here. All right, so we talked about all that already. So, back to the very beginning. 1 Peter 1. We just talked about him being an apostle. Now we'll read the rest of it. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles. Remember, exiles. They're not of this world. To dispension of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadonia, Asia, uh, Berthnia, according to the, what does that say? Foreknowledge of God the Father. You were chosen by God, and you responded to it. Jesus says, come unto me all, who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, come unto me. There's a great, there's a great arch that says, come unto me. You're like, I'm coming to Jesus. And you, as you walk through the arch into his kingdom, you look back, chosen from the beginning of the earth. So you think you're chosen by God. It's both. You have free will, but you're also chosen. And that's the beauty of God. Right now, if you hear God speaking, you need to respond to it. So, he goes on and says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, you're chosen, you're elect, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for the obedience to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Basically saying, you are accepted because of the sprinkling of blood, because of God's love to you. You, have, you are now a child of God. May grace and peace be unto you. How many of you want grace and peace? It's unto us. Receive it. Receive the grace and the peace of God. It's ours in Christ Jesus. Receive it in faith. I say to you, receive the grace and and peace of God. Receive the grace 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 and peace of God in Christ Jesus. I receive the grace, unmerited favor, and the peace of God. And at the very end of the book of the Bible, he says this. He basically tells the reason he wrote the book, or the letter actually. By Silvanus, a faithful brother. He was basically a scribe for him. Brother, I have written briefly to you. He says briefly, but it was pretty long. Typical pastor. Exhorting and declaring this is the true 
grace of God. Stand firm in the grace of God of God. No matter what you face, no matter what you're going through, no matter what persecution, no matter what physical problem you have, no matter what relational problem you have, or financial problem you have, or whatever it is, stand in the grace of God, in the, where, in the, in the ability of God, not yourself. My friends, we're going to need that in the coming days. First Peter is all about that. I encourage you to read it. I encourage you to get involved with the community of believers. You see, there's some lessons we can learn from Peter just today. God chooses you first. Jesus is loving and forgiving despite your failings. And let your aim be Jesus, not the opinions of others. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much that you love us so much that you gave Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you desire for us to know you more. Lord, we ask right now, Father, we recognize, Lord, I, I confess, forgive us, oh God, for treating you like a big genie, that we can just get the things we want. Forgive us, oh Father, for putting conditions on you. If you help me, God, then I'll love you. Father, we don't want to be that way. Father, we recognize that we have a treasure, an uncorruptible treasure in heaven, and we have your presence both now and forevermore. Lord, we choose we choose to follow you right now. Lord, we choose to allow you to forgive us of our sins. We choose to walk in faith. And Father, we pray, Lord God, that you would strengthen us, that we would grow strong in you. And Father, that we would put you first above all else. God, we're sorry for thinking it's all about here and now it's not. We know we have a, we have a distant home and we're only pilgrims we're only exiles on this road. Father, I pray you'd help us to join together, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we'd encourage each other and that we would share the good news to other people. For this world needs the light and you are the light in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you guys once again to get connected. We're not called to do this alone. Alone. Uh, alone. It's baloney to go to alone. We encourage you to get connected. Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. It's always community. It's in community we see more of God than we can by ourselves. Pray for one another that you may be healed. So it's important. I encourage you to do that, okay, after the service. And uh, I also want to give you an opportunity. If you've given your life to Christ for the very first time today, I'm going to ask to put the, um, the, the number back up there on the screen. You can text Get your phone out, which I don't have with me. You can text 94090 in the message to, and we're going to help you. Or there's connection cards in the front seat. You're going to pull it out and, and fill it out and put it, in the uh, put it in the boxes. As you walk out of here today, there's a place to put your offering and the connection cards. Also, we want to continue to give unto the Lord. Listen, this is an opportunity. I, I'm telling you right now, my God will supply all of your needs. He will. And the Bible says, test me. Again, in the New Testament, we don't have to, but we get to. And I'm telling you right now, a great economical plan is to trust God with all that he's given you. Tithe, 10%. Save. Spend less than you make. And watch what God will do. It works. You may not be the richest person in the world, but he'll provide all your needs. And that's what the word of God promises us. And it's true. I've lived it. I've seen God provide more than enough for my family, through all sorts of situations. We've been through a lot of ups and downs, growing up, and even now, and God has always been faithful. I've seen God work supernaturally as we trust Him. It works when you trust God. So Father, bless this offering in Jesus' name. We're thanking you right now that we can make a difference across the world, across the street with our children. Even right now, Father, we're able to, to be on Facebook and, uh, and on, be on YouTube. And, and Lord, we're able to make a difference by having a community of people that come together, doing more together than we can by ourselves. We pray you bless this time in Jesus' name.